as we are witnessing widespread hunger and unemployment as a result of the pandemic and the lockdown imposed in response to it a discussion on socio economic rights participative democracy and empowerment becomes more important than ever today we have with us activists aruna roy nikhil de and rakshita swadhi for a discussion on these issues welcome aruna nikhil and rakshita our discussion today is based on a book edited by the three of them which was released recently the title of the book is we the people establishing rights and deepening democracy my first question is about the rights based legislations that the book talks about in the introduction you mentioned that from 2004 to 2014 we have witnessed an important period in indian democracy as this period marked enactment of various rights based legislation however post 2014 these legislations and the rights ensured in them have been undermined could you elaborate on this point 2004 to 2014 was kind of a a uh, kind of a golden period for rights based legislation it was also uh, very pioneering across the world because up up till 2004 and the 2004 election saw this great slogan about india shining but actually the electorate did not necessarily see it as shining as shining at least a large number of people in the electorate and that message came through loud and clear and therefore it became clear that what people needed was very basic access to services and they needed it as rights and that had been part of the manifesto of several of the parties that came together to form the upa so the upa one had a national common minimum program which put many of these rights based legislations the right to information to be strengthened because there was a law which was not implemented at all uh the right to work the national rural employment became the national rural employment guarantee act uh forest rights act um the street vendors act a whole series right to education a whole se- right to food very importantly so a series of laws that were earlier schemes if be- at best or not even conceived of at all became justiciable laws and therefore they became they moved in a sense from the directive principles to the towards legislation which was which was justiciable and that was the idea of the directive principles at the time that the constitution came in uh 2014 saw a reversal in a sense of uh, the dominant discourse in government because right up till 2014 from 2000 from upa 1 to upa 2 the the strength in the rights based legislations went down but after the 2014 elections there was government said that these are all handouts these are uh, we want the market to provide to empower people by giving them proper jobs uh, they said that this is not something that the state should be doing so this entire uh reversal actually we've seen in covid times as as threatening people's right to life because nrega and um, the right to food are two pe- two things that have actually saved people if anything at all and covid is a very good time to review and see how much how effective this has been the book has a series of essays from different angles whether it's from marginalized communities like dalits or whether it's from the point of view of the economy or from the point of view of governance or from the point of view of uh, education and health it's got a whole it comes at the social sector from different angles in a sense to bring this point together actually let's i want to see it from the movement point of view you can let's let's see it more from the point of view of what happened with structural issues look at what happened with the movement as soon as we got independence we just felt that everything would land on our lap because the constitution has given us guarantees and we agitated continued to agitate for the delivery of all those various demands to various whether it was for not building a big dam or whether it was fish workers wanting their rights whether it was people who were being 
you know, vilified by corrupt practices at smaller, lower, bigger levels. We all thought that the system should deliver. And the system was monitored and propelled by the Constitution. It came as a realization uh, to the MKSs and many others that actually if you want to make the system work, then you will have to have the right to proceed against them for non-delivery. But if you don't have the right to lodge a case against that person or lodge a complaint against that person for non-delivery, with the fruits of that complaint being a working order or a speaking order, there was no way it would become effective. For years, and it's not because of not the lack of effort, because there have been very good people, even in the system, who have tried very hard to deliver, but the delivery has never taken place. So for that simple reason, the translation of a demand to a right was a very important transition. And I think it led up to it. It was not that it happened in a day. The decade before 2005 was a very important decade when this was led up to it. And it so happened that in 2004, when the UPA won the election, they gave a statement of their intent called the National Common Minimum Program. And in that program, they made promises to the people of India. And the first one was an Indian RED, and the other one was a most painted RTI Act which appealed to us. And there were other acts that they promised in the process, all rights. They promised the rights that we were demanding. If you wanted a right to information, the right to food security, the right to employment, the right to education, the right to forest rights. They understood, in a sense, the better part of the political system and the bureaucratic system kind of understood that this was necessary for um, uh, for a uh, for the country to function. So they set up the National Advisory Council, which uh, invited many civil society people to be part of it. Not all civil society, it was composed of members of parliament, it was composed of members of planning commission, etc., but also civil society members. And it gave us the space to ensure that these rights based draft legislations, which we already had, many of them, were enacted. And that's why that period was so important. It was participatory democracy at its best, and and uh, that's why it was a very important period, uh, an extremely important period in the history of not only of the rights of people, but of Indian democracy. Rakshita, would you like to talk about what has changed post-2040? How, what the undermining of these rights has meant? How has it unfolded? Yeah, so I mean, uh, it's also that the undermining of these rights was uh, like was also pointed out before it did begin from the upa two time onwards and we saw the ways in which that manifested so it began with a cutback in expenditure underfunding became the first obvious way of undermining these rights um, and of course post 2014 we've seen that magnify in a, a very large proportion so the the way showed by uh, a previous dispensation was really built upon an underfunding. So NREGA, uh, the Food Security Act, uh, you had you had critical pieces of legislation not being provided the adequate amount of funds that it needed to be able to show the kind of an impact it was set to create. Uh, then post 2014, we've also seen this culture of debasing these rights. So it was not just um, mechanistically undermining them but you had say a prime minister on the floor of the house in parliament um, mocking nrega and saying that what use the, the only purpose that this law should be kept alive is to remind people of the failures of india so that is uh, that is an undermining which is not quantitative in nature but it really shows uh, it sets a it sets a sort of a uh, dictate down the line to the ad bureaucracy to the administration so that kind of a debasing of um, laws has really begun 2014 onwards and we've seen these rights-based legislations as being seen and called the complete opposite which is doles are being given to people these are handouts which it's actually completely the opposite of um, and the whole conversation has now begun around uh, any social welfare is looking at insurance models involving private sector. So the imagination of uh, social development and welfare is now leaning towards uh, like a model which is more of an Atmanirbhar package or contributory pensions and not rights. 
um, justiciable rights. And the one thing that I just wanted to uh, mention in regard to your previous question is how are they, I mean, how these laws being undermined are affecting COVID relief and recovery. Uh, it's also showing that at the end of the day, after all that these rights were blamed for by this dispensation, they've had to rely only on these rights to be able to bring any semblance of recovery in rural areas. So they, one has to rely on the National Food Security Act to be delivering pensions, the NREGA to give uh, basic uh, minimum wages. So it's also shown the power of these rights that in spite of any political dispensation at power, uh, these rights are actually what um, the state resorts to to be able to look after it. If we look 2014 to 2020, and if we look at all the kinds of social policy related interventions made by this government, they are not uh, going towards justiciable rights. It's Atmanirmar programs, uh, Ayushman Bharat, which is insurance-based healthcare, or um, model villages, or uh, Pradhan Mantri, Adarsh Gram Yojana, which are convergence schemes, so and the social security pensions, which are contributory. So it's the one can only comment on what is the nature of these policies that this government is um, introducing by looking at the nature of these schemes, which are non just. That's what if I, I can add to what Rashika is saying that very simply, the pre previous period looked at legislations of empowerment. Post 2014, there are just programs. And if you have been or have any acquaintance with civil service uh, jargon, you will understand that a legislative law is empowering and is permanent. A procedural program is just a program. And this program not only is a program, but doesn't really lead to any empowerment, it's a handout. So there's a great deal of difference between empowering you to access and a handout. Building on what you said earlier, Aruna, that certain schemes and relief programs are replacing concretely guaranteed rights under legislations. Do you think this approach of our current government of undermining rights on one hand and handing out relief schemes on the other hand, do you see this approach as uh, exclusionary and non-participative? This government has not really enacted major uh, policy, so, but it has tried to reduce the extent of all these laws and the scope of these laws, whether it's the right to, right to other laws, right based right education. But it has to, cannot, as Rakshita said, tamper with the basic law on this rules and sets it aside in parliament. So these are laws. Uh, but Today, if you look at the period from 2014, as contrasted with the previous two terms of the parliament, the difference lies in the fact that the people were involved in a very systematic and completely integral form with the framing of policy between 2004 and 14. Systems were set up by which people's views could be taken on board there were consultations, apart from consultations, there were also websites where information was posted. Today, most of these decisions are not only not taken in consultation with people, they are taken by very few people. So you don't even have an entire youth planning commission which had to be consulted. You have a Niti Aayog with three people or four people who are visible. We don't know how many take the decisions. Then there is no reference to parliament for most of these important decisions. Decisions are taken arbitrarily by the prime minister with a few other people. This first thing is that it's taken in a very small group and does not reflect democratic process. The second is that there is no sharing of information. So it's completely non-transparent. There is every policy should be put in the public domain to elicit people's opinions and opinions and reservations before policy becomes law. In this case, they haven't done it. And if you go back to the book, which argues that there should be a welfare state, the welfare state, as was set up in 1950, really argues for a structure in which 
there is a balanced development and in that balanced development which balances there are many balances but i prefer to this balance particular balance of people and the power structures that we elect to govern us so there should be a permanent and continuing structural participatory process which has been absolutely denied so in the process what has happened is that we're getting these grand gestures of handouts but which are only scratching the surface they are not really going to the basis of these problems that we have and people have innumerable problems with those even those services that are handed out but have no platform to voice their their issues or to be heard so really all in all it's a completely non participatory process top down mainly of course procedures of procedural uh, and uh, programmatic uh, approach to development and to governance which is uh, limiting at the best of times the only thing that i wanted to add was actually to further um, if if need be repeat aruna ji's point about um, these these laws also the way they came through i mean the national advisory council had a really institutional role to play in in this time in this decade of 10 years where so many of these rights came and the the and The, the even the national advisory council played a role in a participatory pre legislative process so it was what are these platforms which through which inputs are going to be sought and deliberations are going to take place and one legacy that not only did this period leave us with these rights which us which we continue to see are so valuable like the food security forest rights act and rj but it also left a legacy of what a transparent and a participatory pre legislative process can look like so in 2014 this is something that's hardly ever really showcased and discussed but one contribution of the national advisory council was also to leave with the ministry of law and justice which is a direction an order issued by the ministry of law saying what are the steps that should be followed before government uh, enacts a law how do you seek inputs from public how do you consult and proactively consult with people who are going to be most affected how do you demystify all these jargons and laws and explain to people what will be the potential impact Uh, so there are all these standards that were also laid out laid out which we see are being flouted literally on a daily basis uh, we've seen so many laws and policies come which are not adhering to any semblance of a consultative process so that's it's also uh, that part the last set of questions that i have are uh, first what impact do you see of um, of this type of a government which is clearly moving towards a very centralized approach to governance and uh, it's it's really a power aggregating government what impact do you see it having uh, in the recent years the second question is what uh, immediate relief measures would you suggest for uh, for responding to the current situation of pandemic and the unemployment hunger that is resulting because of it see what has happened is that every single step in which government has acted whether it is the enactment of policy legislation or in terms of consultation through various institutions that were set up for consultation consultation has completely uh, has gone to a downslide so you see that not only are public people they would the public domain like us if civil society not consulted you see that the federal structure itself is harmed because you don't have the states consulted in many ways and there's a choice of only those states which have the same political view as the center consulted or maybe co-opted into a system but for the rest when there are differences of opinion they are not even considered so really it is uh, for all of us to think about how much pressure we should put also on our representatives and our political other political parties in the opposition to demand that they get the federal equal federal system working in a manner in which it should so that's one thing and the second thing that i want to remark on this and then i hand over to the chief the kind of parga that we all have had to put on in terms of the fear of the disease and in terms of mobility and in terms of mobilization 
that it has really put a pada on the kind of activity that would have forced the government at some point of time to take note of us. So because of that, huge centralization has occurred and there has even been that kind of massive protest there would have been if we hadn't been trapped by the disease and fear of infection. First say that there are a, a couple of chapters in this book that talk about the contrasting of ideas. You talked about centralization. Centralization is an idea. And even though the BJP had talked about federalism a lot when it was in opposition, it is absolutely clear that it has centralized and COVID has been used even more to centralize. So the contrast is there is a chapter from Thomas Isaac, who is the finance minister of Kerala, and Mr. Vijayanand, who spent decades looking at Kerala's decentralization process about how a bottom-up approach can be. And that chapter was written before COVID came, but it actually shows you how Kerala dealt with COVID in a completely decentralized manner. And that therefore it has been so much more powerful in its response. So it is a contrast of ideas. Can a vast country like India deal with a crisis in that fashion? The I will request Rakshita to talk about because the, the chapter that she looks at is a bottom-up approach to monitoring. How do public audits, social audits, how do people themselves monitor? So she will talk about that. So that chapter also looks from bottom up, but so do the others. So do the, there's a chapter on uh, question of inequality. Look at it. What, what has actually happened bot at the bottom? So does a chapter on Dalits and tribals look at it in that kind of fashion. Uh, so these are, and when you come to the question of ideas, uh, we have discussed that, is this an opportunity actually when you face a crisis? to see can you have a completely renewed idea of that welfare state? Can that be the answer to the crisis? And can that be what we were looking for all along? So like the New Deal in America when there was a Great Depression, we have said and the chapter, for instance, that Rajendran and uh, Annie Raja have about employment. Narega has had, they've had to increase by 40,000 crores. There are huge demands for the a much larger Narega. There's a demand for an urban employment guarantee act. So can you have a new deal for India where education, where health, these are all basic rights. These are not luxuries, but can you meet them at a time of crisis? And that this book should be able to lead to that debate a little bit more. Right. And just to add to uh, this point itself of what even the book is trying to show as a way, but also in response to this kind of a uh, crisis, a, a social and economic and actually a political crisis that this COVID has shown us, um, a few things that even the book talks about and demands that are being repeatedly made by people's campaigns and movements is to expand uh, the entitlement, existing entitlement of NREGA from 100 days to 200 days, entitlements that are made available to families be in fact be made available to individual workers, the urban, uh, an equivalent of an NREGA to be launched in urban areas, the urban employment guarantee uh, laws, then to universalize PDS and pension because we've also seen uh, the inadequacy of the NFSA coverage during these COVID times. So these are uh, some of the urgent, um, what you had requested, socioeconomic measures that can be introduced, which the relevance of which has been outlined in the book, but is also being repeatedly made by people's campaigns and movements uh, in every public platform possible. I want to say yeah, one thing that the title itself, We the People uh, Establishing Rights, develop, uh, Deepening Democracy, I think that title says a lot about the point of view of the book, that it is from people's campaigns that it draws its lessons and people's movements over the years, that it combines development with democracy and it seeks to continually establish rights as a way in which people will have a greater say. Thank you, Aruna, Nikhil, and Rakshita. It was a very insightful discussion with the three of you.